Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of The Crossroads. I am your host, Rashida Green, and this is the show for and about environmental justice and those who fight the fight with skin as melanated as the days are long. Knowledge is power, and we are breaking down stereotypes one episode at a time. I am super pumped. (laughs) I'm pumped because I have an amazing person here with me today a doctorate, a farmer, a writer. I have Christina Hilton here with me today, the creator of Iron Lion Farms. Hello. Hello. It's so nice to see you. It is so great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my goodness. We have. Thanks for having me. Yes. We have so many things to talk about, but before we get there, We're going to give some flowers. This is the part in the show where we honor someone either in our lives or, you know, maybe not any longer um, that has made an impact. Uh, Do you want to go first? Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. I definitely want to give thanks, um, you know, to my grandmother, Rosalie, who really inspired me um, first and foremost Um, and, you know, followed right behind her. There are lots of people to give thanks, but I'd also love to give thanks an honor to Harriet Tubman as well. Mm. Yes. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> I, I am going to actually, I'm giving flowers to um, Ibrahim Ba. He's okay. actually, um, he was the first guest I ever had on my show. Okay. Um, and he and I actually had a great conversation about a couple of documentaries that he created and produced himself called food clothing and shelter about land management about land use and farming Mm -hmm. and getting folks back in touch with with the earth so i'm gonna give some flowers to him um yeah just (laughs) yeah i'm gonna do that (laughs) so we have a lot to talk about um can you please talk to us about iron lion farms the origin story and just some of the, just if you, a taste of some of the amazing things that you guys are doing. Oh, give thanks for the word sound. Yeah, well, Iron Lion Farm um, is a family farm. Um, you know, its name is inspired by iron as fortifying the body. The blood is an important um, metal in the earth, right? Especially for women's bodies, but for everyone. Um, it really gives us that strength. And of course, Lion, you know, is that very patient, but um, very courageous, you know, and a very royal animal. Um, And of course, you know, is the iron lion in Zion. (laughs) So (laughs) that's how it kind of gets its name. But it's a family farm. Um, You know, we've always been into agriculture, you know, my partner and I, uh, Dexter and Hilton, and our children. So, you know, it just kind of came about organically. You know, we were able to purchase some land, and that's a whole nother story in itself, how that came about. <laughs> um, but we were able to purchase some land, 20 acres, uh, and, and go ahead and start. And we farm on a, approximately uh, 2.75 acres of land. Mm. Uh, we, we only have one field in production. The other ones are in cover crop right now mm-hmm. because we're both working too as well, other, other jobs and also the nonprofit. <laughs> oh my goodness going on yeah (laughs) so I wanted I you know what is one thing that you wish people knew about land management what is just as you've been you know as you have learned to manage this land that you were the and even just the process of purchasing land you know what what is just some things that you wish most the average folks um knew about it yeah, I guess I want to answer that in uh, two parts. So one is that land management is really um, an interna- uh, an intergenerational um, venture, mm-hmm. you know, um, and land land is power, right? Um, and I don't mean power in the sense of colonial power, but I mean power in the sense of freedom. Um, and freedom gives you that kind of um, ability to be self-determined. Um, and to me, that's power. Um, so land is super important. And, you know, I guess I would say to folks who who have land and, um, you know, are not are absent from their land, maybe they moved away or they've inherited land, that there are multiple ways that you can keep your land and use your land 
uh, to create income, even through sustainable forestry practices where you don't have to be fully present. I would say to hold on to the land because in uh, 1910, you know, Black people collectively in this country owned approximately 15 million acres of land, you know, and really that's not that much considering, you know, Ted Turner himself owns like 5 million acres of land in the country. Um, I'm just saying. Uh, I did it, not know that. You know, <laughs> but, um, you know, today it's arguable if we own even 5 million collectively, right? And so without land, you know, you we don't have the ability to create any kind of equity. We don't have the ability to really, um, you know, be self-determined. We can't build our institutions. There, there's not, it's kind of landless people is a, is a path to second-class citizenship. Mm. And so I think if I had any advice would be to hold on to the land that you have, work out the family issues if it's an heir property, um, and know that when we have land, land needs to be planned for generations to come, right? We have to look back to collect that information of our ancestors, our parents, our foreparents, and be able to be innovative for our future generations, not just the next generation, but for our great-grandchildren and our great-great-great-grandchildren. You know, when you we're also talking about, you know, land management, we also have to bring into the fact that, you know, historically black farmers have been, have had their land taken away from them. Yes. Um, what is your, from your perspective, if, well, first, let me back up. Aside from you, does anyone else in your family or your immediate family farm? Um, aside from my, you know, my partner, my husband, um, and my kids with me, um, no, <laughs> in my immediate family farms. Um, you know, my mother was definitely a gardener um, and we grew up gardening. My grandmother, you know, who has transitioned and, you know, guides me as an ancestor, um, was definitely a farmer, a small farmer. Um, but nevertheless, she definitely had um, vegetables and was able to sell some as well. But no, nobody else in my immediate family does. And the reason that I asked that question is, like you said, this is something that is farming was intended and has been historically intergenerational. It is what right. the purpose of having larger families was to work the soil um, and to help the, the family to to feed and sustain themselves. And right. so now that we have like since moved away from that and mm -hmm. in pretty much every single way, well, how are what are some for you? What are some practices that you've incorporated? Um, that mm -hmm. either like ancestral ones that you've incorporated mm -hmm. that you're now teaching to to your children? Yes. So um, definitely what we do is regenerative agriculture. And we kind of define that as ways of our foreparents, right? So people spend a lot of money to go to classes and learn in university about this organic farming. But that's something that I know that my my mother my and my uh, grandmother certainly was doing they didn't know the term organic. Right. First, like all of the leaves were piled up. Um, for my grandmother who had a wood burning stove, like even the ash, um, and that's something that I do as well, um, was used, you know, as a potash, um, potassium rich, you know, additive to your soil. So things like that. And also, um, you know, one thing I remember my grandmother doing is she always collected seeds, mm. like plants went to seed, that was purposeful. There were some plants that were used for that purpose, you know, particularly herbs or things like that. Those went to seed and those seeds were collected. And then also cuttings. Um, and she used to share, especially flowers. Um, you know, she used to share and always be like, oh, honey, go put that in some water and we'll root it. And, you know, that's definitely something that I carry on. And I, I think, um, my children enjoy doing too. They love to cut flowers and put them in water and then, oh, it's rooted, it's rooted. And mm -hmm. they get it, you know? So yeah, that's definitely something we do. And when you, uh, you talked earlier about a couple of your lots are in cover cropping. And yes. I, I really want to pull the car over to talk about that because <laughs> I, you know, that there, I'm sure you're well aware of the pressure that a lot of folks and, far and farmers feel to utilize uh, pesticides to maintain their yeah. crops. 
and the damage that that is doing, um, obviously to our planet and cover cropping it first mm. before I, I don't want to spoil it, but can you break down what cover cropping is and why it's important? Yeah. Well, you know, my understanding with cover cropping really comes from like the work of, um, you know, Dr. Carver, um, you know, so this idea with how cotton was was pulling so much nitrogen out of the soil, you know, and nitrogen is such an important part of soil development and plant development, right, for photosynthesis to occur and things like that and for plants to get its food. Um, and so, you know, that, that cotton was just pulling all of that out and not returning it. And some plants will absorb it, but also return it back to the soil. And cotton is not one of them. It's just, it's just a taker. Hmm. Right? Ironic. Kind of right? <laughs> it's very ironic, right? So it just takes and takes and takes. Um, so cover cropping, you know, helps to uh, regenerate the soil. It adds natural amendments back to the soil. So things such as peanuts, are going to add back uh, nitrogen because it's a legume. So legumous or any kind of bean plant too is also a legumous plant that's going to add back nitrogen and nutrients, particularly macronutrients that nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus back into the soil, right? So and so does sweet potatoes, right? Um, mm -hmm. Lots of different cover crops that you can use that are also cash crops. You know, so peanuts and uh, sweet potatoes happen to be two of those. But then there are other, you know, there's a ton of, it, and it depends on what you want the cover crop for. Some people want it to, you know, kind of break up some of the compaction of the soil if it hasn't been farmed in a really long time. Mm -hmm. So um, you could do that as well. And going back to Iron Line Farms, you yeah. have something very special going on that you're in the midst of right now. Could you please talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes, our, our camps that we've been having. Yes. So, um, you know, Iron Lion Farm is designed to not just um, produce, um, you know, pr uh, produce or fresh vegetables. We do have some, some animals as well. We have some chicken here and some rabbits. Um, but our um, main part is education. Right. So we offer a lot of educational services in the spirit of bringing people back to the land and um, disconnecting and reconnecting. Right. Uh, so disconnecting from the everyday busyness that disconnects us and coming back and taking off your shoes and grounding yourself and reconnecting with yourself, with nature and one to another. Um, and so we've had some really nice camps. We have a um, program called Camp and Learn where people come and they camp overnight um, and they may come with a group, a youth group, mm -hmm. um, may just be family, something like that. And um, th we host various workshops. So we also have bees here as well, um, our insects. So yes, we're beekeepers as well. Um, and so we'll do like beekeeping workshops. We might do income generation workshops, like, you know, what you can do with byproducts. Because a lot of people get uh, focused on the honey mm -hmm. and honey is great, but it is the cheapest of the uh, byproducts. Right. So um, there's things like wax production that you can do that make a higher income for you. Um, so not the cheapest, but the uh, probably the least in terms of the income generation is what I mean. OK. And so we do various workshops. So it's called Camp and Learn. And then, of course, we also do activities uh, with folks as well, you know, outdoor activities. It might be archery. It might be some other little things, some hiking, going down mm. a few creeks on the land. So it's really nice. Um, we've also done some, we just finished a writing workshop. Uh, so That's it's mostly writing what I'm excited wild. about. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the writing into the wild, um, you know, um, this is our second year hosting that one. And so this year, our focus of writing into the wild was blossoming in your creativity using the four elements. So we did um, some. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> some sensory activities, um, and as well as some guided meditations. Um, and then we end the evening with a big bonfire, um, and we do some storytelling and some activities around fire as a cleansing element. So the inner and outer elements. Um, how do we use those to, you know, blossom in our creativity? So that was this year's. It was great fun. It was beautiful. People came up with beautiful stories. I'm so grateful 
Yeah. Are you going to post them on like your website or anywhere so that people can read it? Yes. Or? Yeah, um, okay. yeah, we might be able to post some of them. Um, okay. I think well, it was personal, you know, oh. for some, it was things that they're working on or working towards in their short stories and creativity. And some people really just came out just to reground themselves and reconnect with nature. Um, you know, we have a saying here at uh, Iron Line Farm that, you know, whenever we connect with nature, we're connecting with ourselves ourself we're connecting with nature because in the end we are the earth you know when we think about what makes up the earth we talk about minerals and metals that's everything that's in our body you know if you name something like calcium potassium well all of those are really important for our life systems right um we are the air without air without the breath of life you know there's only death there is no life as the ocean as the earth is approximately 75 percent water so is our bodies right depending on our so, um, you know, and then there's fire, there's an internal fire and an external fire, right? And so internal, our fire, we're burning when we're exercising, when we're moving, right? That blood is flowing, it's cleansing, it's cleaning out your blood. And it's the same thing with fire, right? When there's fire on the land, you know, as long as it's not a wild fire, you know, but fire is used to, you know, create new growth, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, when we think about that, we are the elements of earth. We are earth. So when we heal the land, we heal ourselves. When we heal ourselves, we're healing the land because we're cultivating a reflection of one, the earth to ourselves. That's really, so what do you see, like, you know, for the future, do you want to expand the farm or are you just yeah. hoping to maintain? Well, one of the great things is we are actually starting an apprenticeship program or restarting an apprenticeship program. Yes. Yeah, so we have some, we have our first um, group coming out, our first family that's going to come out and stay with us. They'll be staying three, three days a week, um, you know, in a, in a really nice camper. So that's really nice. Um, so I definitely want to see it expand that way. I also want to be able to bridge that gap between urban and rural, that urban and rural divide. Hmm. You know, I really love urban agriculture, but I also really love and understand rural rural ag- agriculture and its different, you know, aspects of it. So I want to be able to bridge those kind of gaps. And then eventually we'll be taking folks to our land space in Jamaica as well um, to really look at health and wellness around land and land-based issues that are reflected um, in terms of colonialism, the the breaking that down and, and what those effects have been, and also the empowerment and how people are pushing back collectively, um, both here in the South as well as in uh, the Caribbean. And we'll particularly be working in Jamaica. Um, and then we'd like to get back to the motherland as well, mm. get these yeah. uh, similar issues. So yes, so that's how we'd like to expand it. And, you know, I think we have like we've more than come to the crossroads, which is the point in the show where we kind of bring everything kind of all together. And because we are in, we are in the summer. Um, I've, I don't know about you, but I've, I've started to change my perspective about how, and start to think a little bit more um, in terms of the older strategies that we used to utilize mm-hmm. in our preparation for winter. Like this was the right. time where we ate well, we, right. but we also stored in preparation for the future and yes. preparation yes. for winter. And yes. what I find to be is kind of the separation or the, when you're speaking about the gap between urban and rural agriculture, I would also say that it's just the culture as well is different too, yeah. that folks yes. don't understand the relationship that we should be having with the earth and how right. everything in the built environment depends on the natural. So yes. From from your perspective, kind of just focusing on on farming and health and wellness. When we think about the summer, what are some things that we should be doing to feed ourselves, but also to prepare? So one thing I love about the summer is it's full of fruit, right? So summertime, fruits have what? All of our vitamins, right? And those vitamins, especially that vitamin C, you know, really helps with freeing free radicals in the body. It really helps to boost the immune system. You know, summertime is the end of the herbs, usually. You know, herbs is the medicine, 
right? So we're drinking those teas, we're fortifying our body, we're getting all the iron that we need, all the potassium, all the magnesium, all the calcium, all the nutrients that we need to really fortify our bodies for the winter. And then of course, There is the, um, you know, storing of the food as you talked about, right? So, you know, in the fall time, when you start um, pulling out some of your uh, sweet potatoes and whatnot, you can put them, you know, you can do things. One thing that an elder once explained to me is that they used to dig a hole and just stack it with some hay and then put their sweet potatoes in there and cover it up with hay and nothing would even trouble them. Hmm. Um, stored it. So yes, when you're living close with nature, you're definitely living by the seasons. Um, And therefore we should be uh, fortifying our bodies like the seasons as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So winter time, you know, we want to store, we store everything. It's time for new growth, right? It's time to go within. It's time to heal. It's time to get ready for the spring for new growth. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, I think that, you know, filling up on that vitamin C, filling up on the immune system, those fruits, you know, all of those seeded plants, you know, that's what we're doing. We're planting seeds Mm -hmm. for spring to come for new growth in our life. I love that. And so is there anything like first, are there any activities or, or upcoming activities or even ways to that folks can support you? What are, are there any endeavors that you're looking for? Just a lot of kind of like, I guess, community support to have or anything along those lines? Because we're kind of closing out. So I want to make sure you have an opportunity to like, nah, all the amazing things that you guys (laughs) are doing. Thanks. Yes. Well, um, definitely. We always love volunteer support. We uh, warmly welcome that. Uh, We have volunteer days. Uh, You can check us out on at Iron Lion Farm on Instagram. Um, You know, I also am a full-time educator as well and running a nonprofit. So, um, you know, I can only do so much on the farm too. So we do um, (laughs) client on on volunteers coming out to support us. Um, But we also have some activities and I think it's important that we get together around land. I mean, times are serious. They always have been serious. They're more and more serious. Um, You know, it's very disheartening to me to see where we are in 2021, you know, um, how far away from um, our legacy builders of the reconstruction period we have come, um, gone, you know? And so I think like coming together around land and really thinking collectively in togetherness and healing ourselves through nature um, is really important. So I like to say we're reflections of one another. And so I think one way of supporting us is supporting yourself by connecting and coming out and connecting um, because I am because we are right Mm. and so we do have some activities coming up we have a fall festival that we'll do in October we have a harvest festival that we're going to do in November and then we definitely will rest as well Mm. um, in those months and be ready for spring Um, So I would love anyone to check us out. We'll post um, volunteer days. If you're interested in being an apprentice, um, you can definitely, you know, direct message me, send me an email. All that information is on um, at Iron Lion Farm on Instagram. Christina, thank you so, so, so much for being here. I really, really, really appreciate it. And I did not mean to say agreed instead of Ashe. (laughs) <laughs> I was just blanking and I was like, agree. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, give thanks for the word sound anyway. Yes. You thank know. you so much. And this has been thank really you. amazing. And I, you know, I hope to have, I would love to have you back on the show. And just to let you know, I don't know if you're already involved, but the Black Sustainability um, Network and Summit. Yes. Okay. So, um, I'm the person that runs that actually is the one who introduced me to Abrima. Um, and she does a a summit in Ghana. Um, they've been trying to do it every year. So I'll, if you don't, I will. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. With sister Turner there. Yes. Raina, I love yeah. her. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. I've been trying to do a little bit more with them, but yes, definitely. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you know, you. 
I love it. I've been following you for a while, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I can't even, yes. I'm fangirling. I'm like actually fangirling. <laughs> like as you told, as I like yes. found more things, like a writing conference, a PhD <laughs> in awesomeness. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like so excited. <laughs> give thanks, give thanks. And I hope you'll come and visit us on the farm as oh, well. Oh yeah. I will definitely make an effort to come on down to that farm because yes. I need to yeah, I need to yes. learn. I, things. I can do some basic stuff, but I'm not like, yeah. you know, I can keep the plants alive. Yes, <laughs> you can. You know, that's what I tell everyone. Look, it's already in us. It's just within us. It's that's just true. to and recall it and get with it because, you know, we already know it. That's Love. very true. All right. The kids yeah. are loose. Thank you yes, all so are. much. <laughs> Thank you all <laughs> so much Thanks. for joining us. And Thanks. we will see you again at the crossroads. All right. Blessed love.